Welcome to the Painting of the Week podcast, where we look at some of the most significant paintings throughout history. Introducing your hosts, Phil Grabsky and Laura Bentham. Well, welcome to this week's Painting of the Week. And appropriately enough, uh, we are in a very hot and sunny Brighton. I'm Phil. And I'm Laura. <laughs> Still in a silly mood. And this week we're going to talk about Edward Hopper's People in the Sun. Mm. And uh, as I say, outside it is, in fact, it's so hot. Yes. Which isn't really that hot. But the government has decided it needed to issue a, a declaration <laughs> of how we should behave. A, a hot weather warning, which we've never had before. And uh, what did the hot weather warning it tell us? It involves us, we need to come indoors close the curtains and not look at the sun. Brilliant. So um, <laughs> thank you for that, because otherwise I'd have been outdoors, uh, probably wearing jumpers and, and, staring, curtains. And, and curtains and staring straight at the sun. So thank you to the government for telling us how to behave in the heat. <laughs> uh, and don't write in, because I'm sure it is a very serious matter. And people no. However, it's quite interesting because uh, in this painting, People in the Sun... They obviously didn't get that government warning because no. they're all outdoors wearing suits and scarves and, I don't know, yeah, really quite inappropriate kind of thing. And if this is in the Midwest, it's certainly going to be a lot hotter than it is here today. Um, Edward Hopper is, and as I'm discovering, because we're making a film about him and I talk about Edward Hopper to people, he is amongst a lot of people's favourite artists. Although I think that is based on... A few of his famous paintings, like um, uh, Nighthawks or New York Movie, and I and I think that's because so many of those paintings are very cinematic, and we can talk about this later. But filmmakers have kind of copied his style, and so there's a lot of kind of interweaving of film and painting. Um, but this painting is interesting because it actually mixes two important elements of his life and career, which is his traveling through the Midwest, through the United States. Um, and he painted and etched a lot of landscapes along the way. And then those later, more cinematic uh, paintings that, that are perhaps a bit more famous. Um, and then of course, some of the subject matter is, is very Hopper-esque in this painting. Wow. Well, I... I've only looked at him this week, normal. Um, have you must? Did you look at him when you were at college? I mean, you're a filmmaker, Phil. Phil the filmmaker. It's like Postman Pack. And we should be doing exhibition on screen children's books. <laughs> don't. Don't give us any more ideas. We simply don't have but the time. When you're at college, his light is extraordinary, though. I, I don't think we studied paintings enough. Oh. as filmmakers when we were at college, uh, actually. In fact, the more that I've worked on paintings, if it's not immodest to say so, I'd say the better a filmmaker I've become. Oh. Um, and I've still got plenty, you know, plenty to learn and, and much to improve. But um, I think the standard for us and probably a lot of film, well, there weren't actually that many film courses in at that time. Right. And... Um, but you looked at other people's films and you'd go right back to the, you know, the cabinet of Dr. Kelly Yari or um, Nanook of the North. I mean, you go right back and look at the history of filmmaking. We didn't really do a lot of kind of cross media. So we didn't read books that somehow would evoke something that would help us with filmmaking. Or we didn't read enough. We didn't go and see plays that are... Anyway, we certainly didn't look at paintings. Okay. It's just his light. All week is all I've looked at. Well, see, something like this would have been great as a filmmaker because actually when I started filmmaking, <clears throat> I think the first really big series I got was something called Spain in the Shadow of the Sun. That was a four-part series for Channel 4. It was about the history of Spain. And the way that I chose to do it, 1988, so I was 25. The way I chose to do it was to, um, it was about how Spain had changed since the death of Franco. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was, quote unquote, the good old days when basically Channel 4 
it was a struggle to get there. But in the end, we were given a budget and given a year and a half and told to go away and go to Spain, live in Spain, learn the language and make, make the films. Nice. And the way that I chose to do it was to make four portraits of four Spanish individuals that reflected different elements of the new Spain. So episode one was about a woman in the world of, she, was a, she raised bulls okay. for the bullfight. So you had the very traditional perception of Spain and a modern woman and how they were interwoven, working together and clashing. Episode two was about a, a, a captain in a parachute regiment. He had a picture of Franco on his wall, but he also had quite modern attitudes in other ways. Episode three was a young girl with aspirations to go to university and get on in her life, but she was from a very poor village in Extremadura, mm -hmm. which is a poor part of Spain. And then the fourth episode was about a journalist for a magazine called The European, based in, um, in Madrid. And, you know, he was the forward kind of vanguard of, of you know, S S Spain, Spanish thinking. And the point I was going to make was that I storyboarded every episode. Yeah. So I would have, and I would draw pictures like this, and like you know, as best I could, how I wanted things, particularly that first episode in Andalusia or in Sevilla where we were filming. And we'd, we'd go into scenes and we would actually create the scene to look like the storyboard. There came a point when there was a tension between what I was trying to create and, and the reality. And then you're starting to think, hold on, this is supposed to be a documentary film. And actually the tables weren't like that, or there wasn't that poster on the wall. So it started to fade away a little bit. It was a great, it was really useful as a practice. One, because it made you think about every single frame that you were doing and what the story was. And two, it was also when you, when you have created a storyboard, as the name suggests, you are really very attentive to the idea of storytelling, yeah. which is at the heart of every film. The one thing that my course did teach, and it's really important when you're looking at a painting like this, it, was, it wasn't a great course in some ways in terms of its vocation. They, they deliberately said, look, we're not a vocational course, we're a theoretical filmmaking course, i.e. it's about the content of the, of the image. And there's actually something called semiology, which is the science of signs. I won't go into it too much detail. What they're basically saying is there is no such thing as a passive frame, everything has a meaning. So you've probably seen in the way that I look at paintings, there are no, there are no accidents, everything is, mm. is signifying something. So to give a really, really obvious example, if you look at advertisements, yeah. if you've got an, an image for Campari and in that image, there is a girl's leg in a black stocking with a red stiletto. I mean, there's a really clear signs yeah. of something. Mm. These days would feel kind of outdated quite rightly, but, um, or even the way you position a camera looking at someone. If you're looking up at someone, you're kind of making them feel quite heroic. If you're looking at eye level, it's much more neutral. If you're looking down on them, you're kind of crushing them in the frame. And if they feel somewhat diminished, um, Every, every, so you've got to think about all these things. So when you come to a picture like this, you, you, know, you might walk up to the sign. You don't look at the painting. You look at the sign first. People in the sun, you think it's going to be people sunbathing. Yeah. Actually, it's almost, you know, these, these, you know, when you start looking at it, it starts to tell you a very different story or not necessarily the story that you thought you were going to see. So oh. what do you take from this picture? Because you're saying, I mean, I didn't know it particularly well. I, I didn't know it at all. So what do you... When you said it the other week. So what do you see? You know, just the fact that they're all... Well, for me, they're not even talking. Yeah. <laughs> so instantly I'm like, mm, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> Why are they not talking? So what do you think is going on? I think they are just relaxing and staring out, which after looking at the, a lot of his paintings <clears throat> this week... I realise that a lot of them mm. are paintings where people are staring out. He loves a he loves a good window. But where do you, where do you think they are, and why do you oh, think they're there? I don't know where they are, but I did look. Wasn't he living around Cape Cod, which I had to look up? Mm. I've never been. Have you? I have been to Cape mm. Cod. Yeah. So 
I would like to go. But I think it was a hotel, isn't it, this one? Well, this is this is the Midwest. Yeah. So this is the heartlands of, of the United States. And I read somewhere else that it's a hotel, but let's not necessarily assume that what someone else has written about it is correct. No. So I think there's something really strange about this picture. Mm. And I don't know how much of it is deliberate, but in in some of those prairie states, you know, where they, they just have, I mean, these days they have enormous farms, yeah. whether it's for raising cattle or for grain. But this is this is a massive, massive grain field somewhere in the Midwest with that slightly dark and foreboding and not terribly attractive range of mountains. I don't think they're attractive at all. It almost reminds me of the kind of Middle Age. In the Middle Ages, mountains were considered to be the home of devils and really quite mm. scary places. There's something quite dark about them. They remind me, actually, in a film I've just finished about Afghanistan, the main character lives in a village in the centre of Afghanistan with mountains like that. Right. And they produce, and it's, and it's a coal mining village. And this, that reminds me of the kind of mountains where you, you know, dig, dig down and find coal. But, but somehow, slightly alien to the whole thing, running right down the middle of this cornfield, in fact, right up to the edge, there's no verge, mm -hmm. there's no signs, there's no nothing, there's no white line. I assume that that, that grey line almost running across the middle is a road. Yeah. I assume that they're on some kind of concrete patio. Mm -hmm. And then I think to myself, well, is it somebody's house? Is it, a, is it a bus stop? Or is it, as somebody's pointed out, a, a hotel? I guess it's more likely to be some kind of domestic, somewhere where people stay because the curtains are... Again, you start looking mm -hmm. at the signs. Yeah. So if it was somebody's house... Well, if it was a bus station, you wouldn't necessarily have curtains like that. You wouldn't have the upstairs window in the same kind of way. So let's assume it's either a hotel or a house. It's possibly more likely to be a hotel because the curtains are the same upstairs and downstairs. I don't know. Um, either way, then you look at the characters. Now, if this was somebody's home, there would be somehow there'd be a bit more interrelationship yeah. between them, wouldn't you? Well, you just feel like they would... Someone would look like they were having a chat. Yeah, there's nothing. No. And the only non, the only item other than the chairs mm. is that the guy at the front has a pillow. Mm. There's no cups, there's no beers, <laughs> there's no crisps, there's no peanuts, there's no pizza. What a shame. There's nothing. <laughs> it's just four, well, five chairs. Mm. One, the guy behind... He's got a big fat book. Yeah. <laughs> there is the, the woman, the distance, you can't even see her face. No. She does have something green behind her, which might be a, another cushion or yeah, a blanket. Another chair, maybe. Something, yeah. It is a, it's a fascinating painting. But, I mean, the guy with the moustache, very erect. Yes. <laughs> you know, and he's just staring out straight at the sun. I mean, look at those shadows. Yeah, what are they doing? I mean, it's obviously a sun set because they're very long shadows aren't they i mean there's oh so the sun is going down i almost think it's that they're i mean they're just so it's, the way they're dressed is so peculiar because i mean it's obviously a hot day i know but well, you know i was thinking i mean they just people did dress better taking their shoes off or something nothing there's no there's no no, no relaxation at all no is there? no it does look it does look quite formal so they're just looking out mm. to the sunrise sunset mm. Lost in their own thoughts. Well, a lot of his paintings were sort of lacking. Uh, they sort of had emptiness about them. Ah, look. So he, he is absolutely, I mean, even this week, there was an article about um, people feeling lonely during the ongoing COVID crisis. Yeah. What's the image they use? It's a hopper. Mm. So hopper is the icon of isolation. Right, yeah. So... Those famous images from New York, you've got, you know, ushers staring blankly, you've got waitresses staring blankly, yeah, you've yeah. got the secretary staring, you know, a woman sitting on the edge of a bed and there's, 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 
it's all about um, the isolation of an individual human being. And contemplation. Then. And contemplation. I wonder what he was thinking then. Obviously, once again, we're well, not going to know. Well, one of the things that I'm going to explore in the film that we're making is obviously trying to understand him as an artist much better. Mm. I haven't, I only know, frankly, a superficial amount at the moment. I know that he had, I think it was 42 years, he was married to his wife. She was an artist too. Okay. I know that it was a, a <laughs> fractious relationship, but it, obviously it lasted. Um, yeah, I watched a documentary this week so that I could come a little bit more prepared. And the, I think it was one of his friends who was saying that he used to sort of wind her up on purpose a little bit. She didn't have a lot oh. of, she wasn't much, she didn't have much of a sense of humour. Huh. So he then would wind her up and then she would sort of start going and getting more cross and then he would just sit back and let her carry on with it. That's a bit like me and my husband, actually. <laughs> Matt does that. Yeah, well, you do, you do it in a slightly jocular way. So I've seen you. Well, I think I've seen you. My parents, my, my dad used to do that. He just used to irritate my mum. Mm. And you'd, 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 you'd observe this. You'd think there's no benefit. No. You're not achieving anything. She doesn't like it. She's just getting irritated immediately. You just wound her up. Mm. You haven't achieved anything. It's not like as a result of this, you will get on any better. That, or you're finding it funny. You just. But then maybe that gave him the excuse to go off and. Because obviously she was then in a bad mood, he could go off and sit and look and do a bit more contemplation and maybe another painting. Maybe that's what he needed. I think there's something in him which was just contradictory and just wanted to push people's buttons. Right. I mean, the, the sense I do get of Hopper is that you might, you know, you'd struggle to like him. But that's. I'm aware that that's a bit unfair because I don't know enough about him. No. That's just how he's come across yeah. in one or two kind of other films or articles that I've read. He was quite a difficult personality. I mean, one thing to, to say for him, again, we do think of him as, I mean, he is known for living in that area of Cape Cod, but he's known for painting in New York. New York is undoubtedly the most extraordinary city and you know as a filmmaker yeah. i can't wait to go to new york and film images that will illustrate this film yeah. about hopper because you're going to be seeking to you know you i'm going to be looking to film the diner where there's one person sitting in there looking out the window yeah feeling looking very lonely <laughs> so it's the most it's the most I mean, that small strip of land, it's just extraordinary what, what happened there. But is it also because of the lighting there, though? It's because the lighting's really exact in New York because of the buildings. You know, you get a real clear line. Or am I just overthinking it now? No, I'm not at all. The week looking at his paintings. Not just... at all. Well, again, you, you pointed out on this painting, I mean, look at the, you know, this is a quite a stark yeah. light. It's quite cool. I mean, again, he's being very, okay, again, no accidents. No. Hopper, like all great artists, and we've talked about this before on the podcast, he, he studied the artists that went before him and his contemporaries. He traveled extensively. Yeah. I mean, he, he went to Europe, um, you know, nine, I do know, 1900 to 1906, he went to the New York School of Art. One of his teachers was a guy called William Merritt Chase. Okay, difficult name, one will forget. But William Merritt Chase features in another film that I've made about the American Impressionists. The American Impressionists were hugely influenced by what was happening in France and well, Western Europe more generally. So they brought across those techniques and about trying to capture light and about painting outdoors and other things to do with Impressionism. Interestingly, though, the American Impressionists used those techniques to tell a slightly different story than what was happening in Europe. But then you have the new artists coming in, like Hopper. Who, so the, the, this avant-garde, including Merritt Chase, they, they then become the teachers. Yeah. And the, the kind of older generation, you've got the new guys coming in. Beginning of the 20th century, the birth of modern art in New York, you've got something called the Armory Show, which was very important. 
And Hopper rides the cusp of that. One of the things about Hopper, and again, it's true of all great artists, pretty much I could show you 25 paintings mm. amongst, a, you know, I could take 100 paintings and within there, there'd be 25 Hoppers. You'd spot every Hopper. He creates mm. a distinctive style, mm. which I think is one of the signs of great artists. But within that distinctive style, he shows his knowledge and his learning from the great artists of the past or other elements of painting. So one of the one of the things that comes up time and time again is this idea of complementary colours. Yes. Colour theory. Mm. Don't be scared by colour theory. It's absolutely essential. And there's a couple of really obvious examples here. So red and green are complementary colours. Now, you've probably heard the phrase, I mean, you, you do a lot of work with fashion and clothes and things. So you've probably heard that phrase, you know, red and green should never be seen. Yeah. So, you know, I have, this is an embarrassing story, but I'll tell it because it's only you and me. Oh, good. There we go. It's only you and me. I can't wait for the embarrassing I'm just telling story. You. <laughs> I'll keep all mine under clothes and dad. This is great. <laughs> I used to play, I mean, this is, is an embarrassing story. I used to play a lot of Sunday league football. And <laughs> one night training on a Thursday night, I was pushed. It was an indoor session and I was pushed into a wall and thought I'd broken my little finger. <laughs> so I went to see this uh, osteopath yeah. that, that uh, we knew who was really, really good. And I said, um, I'm not sure, it, I, it may be broken, but maybe you can just kind of manipulate it and get it. And I just thought, frankly, I'd be sitting in the chair and he'd pull my hand and he'd have yeah. a look and he'd go, no, it's broken. And he'd say, no, I can. He said, oh, i get onto the bed. All oh, right. So they had one of those couches. And I wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> to my horror... To my horror, he said, okay, well, it, it, I, I gotta, I've got to kind of work your whole body here because I can see actually you've got some issues with, your, you know, you've done so much running around and I can see that your shoulders are a bit out of shape. And let me just do a full session. And uh, he said, um, so whip your whip, whip me top off, whip your trousers off. So, uh, oh, easy, Phil. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I thought it was really embarrassing. <laughs> well... <laughs> I imagine that the previous Christmas, my mum probably gave me a, a, one of those, you know, underwear oh, no. <laughs> under, underwear sets. And then back in the day, and you know, it was always bright colours. Yeah. <laughs> so on, on this particular, and forgive me if this is too much detail, but on no, this, it's all right. this particular day. It's going to change it to explicit though. I had a pair of green underpants oh, on. Oh, no. <laughs> and red socks. Oh, dear. <laughs> I have never felt more humiliated than that moment because red and green particularly in that state of undress, it should never, ever be seen. From that day forth, I've never, ever worn brightly coloured <laughs> underwear. I was going charge you for that session. 500 pounds. <laughs> you know. um, Did he sort your finger out, though? <laughs> he, well, do you know what? He was amazing. He, he, oh, okay. He, he, he actually did. I've been going to see him now for 25 years, oh. and, he, and he is just fantastic. Oh, well, he wasn't put off then. So, the climbers. I don't know how he got over that hump. <laughs> So, and you paid him. <laughs> and I, I, I've, embar- I've, I've apologised for that moment so many times. In fact, he forgets and I remind him oh, and I apologise. Anyway, oh. point being, look at this painting. Next time you get those. No, no, no let's, right, let's, no, let's leave it now. Because look that's at, it. No, look at this right. painting. <laughs> you know, he's put red yeah. around her neck and mm. he's put green. Now, do a little experiment in your mind. Mm. If you had green around her neck and red at the back... Mm. Actually, the whole thing has changed. This mm. is why some paintings take so long to do mm. because the painters are constantly so changing around. The green just sits at the back a little bit, but it 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 breaks things up. It breaks up again. Those four guys, the four people at the front, are split from the guy at the back by yeah. that little bit of green. The red just divides up the four. Uh, and again, if you look at the way he's done done their clothes, very clever. The guy at the front. Yeah, paler blue, mm. middle blue, darker blue, mm-hmm. and then just to kind of, it would be a bit boring to have a, a very dark blue with the lady with the blonde hair. But again, blonde hair. So you've got green and red yeah. are complementary colours, blue and yellow are complementary colours. So again, no accident is given her blonde hair. Because again, your eyes just kind of unconsciously, subconsciously just kind of wandering around going from the light to the dark and then hits the blonde hair. And again, you've got the, you've got the lines. 
Look at that Absolutely. line. Look at the line of their heads. You get to the blonde. You obviously, you're going to go all the way to the end because she's got the lightest hair. Yeah. And then just look at the, the line at the top of her head takes you down from right to left, down through him. Yeah. Down his, down you go down his arm, down his foot. Foot then right on the shadow. You go up the shadow, back to the guy's feet. So again, very cleverly done. Even the, even the deck chairs. There's all sorts of different ways of doing deck chairs. But he's deliberately chosen. I'm not. I doubt that he was actually sitting painting four chairs like that. Yeah. But again, he's done deck chairs which have these crosses and these lines, which kind of also allows you to look through them. The choice of the grain. I mean, you know, you could have had green grain. Yeah, yeah. But green grain would be some would give you a completely different sense of this. You, mm. they, they feel like they're sitting in a field. This, you know, it's it's yellow. You can feel the heat that's been absorbed by that grain. Again, you've got the blue and yellow contrast. Um, Those mountains also, they look, they could be the sea. I mean, that could be a, couldn't they look at them? I don't know. I don't really like them at all, those mountains. Well, there's no, there's no, not, there's no foliage. Well, I mean, no. obviously they've got a long way away. And if mm. you looked, if actually, if you do look carefully, perhaps you can identify some green kind of shrubbery. And now you said about the clothes, the guy reading the book. It's got like a really sweet little blue cravat on. Yeah. Which I hadn't even noticed this week. Well, he, so, he, he to me is a slightly, he's the kind of, he's obviously the youngest male. Yes. And he's almost deferentially sitting behind the older males. You know? mm. I mean, the guy that's third one along, he, he, you know, he looks like, I mean, obviously this is the United States, but he looks like an RAF captain, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, he does. True. And mm. then the other guy's yeah. balding, nothing wrong with that, of course, but I mean, no, you know. God, um, Absolutely. She's she's really very proper. The, the uh, woman with the red scarf. Um, but these these subjects, isolation. Yeah. Obviously, there's a time. I mean, he does. Okay, he's seventy eight when he paints this. Right. Again, the age of the artist is really important. This is nineteen sixty. Yeah. Some mm -hmm. of his paintings are happening during the Second World War, when understandably he's looking at things, you know, to do with isolation and tension and conflict. And, okay, this is 15 years after the end of the war, but it's still an America that's trying to find itself, the role of individuals in this kind of enormously consumeristic, materialistic country. Yeah. Oh, um, so, uh, yeah, they're such, oh, I love his paintings. I really think they're brilliant. It's made me look at everything differently for some reason this week. I can't stop looking at light. Uh, yeah. And of course, talking to everybody, everybody knows Nighthawk. Yeah. Is it Nighthawks? Yeah, Nighthawks. Yeah, I mean, it's everybody knows everyone, everyone I spoke to. Oh, yes. Love that. So, yeah. I am. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Well, this particular painting, interestingly enough, is at a fantastic museum that I went to, um, I must admit, only for the first time two years ago, 2019, wow. uh, in Washington, D.C., called the Smithsonian American Art Museum. The United States has the most incredible roster of art galleries. Mm -hmm. And as we've mentioned before, that is because of the history of buying and selling paintings mm -hmm. and collections and dealers. And, you know, there was this time after the American Civil War, so into the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, there were, there were people who just generated enormous wealth and chose to spend it for various reasons that we've talked about on art. Oh, yeah. And then for various reasons would... Uh, um, donate it to a collection or to a gallery and they felt that was the right thing to do in a way that doesn't you know it's, it's different today unfortunately only yesterday actually i read in the paper that our government is cutting funding to art courses mm. um you know there's there's, there's yeah. less respect for art here than there was you know we we might think of ourselves i think sometimes we perhaps overestimate ourselves in comparison to people that lived 150 years ago. In the United States at that time, plenty of people struggling, plenty of people who had, didn't have time to think about art. But people with money, for all sorts of different reasons, 
but some of it was appreciation of the art. And like Barnes, he did he amassed an extraordinary collection. He was a he made a fortune out of farm out of uh, being a chemist. Okay. But he you know, he he wrote books on art. He read books in German on art. And I mean he really <laughs> had a just proper appreciation of it and then cre created this collection. It's an extraordinary collection, slightly odd one. Anyway, amazing galleries and museums in the United States. In Washington, it is it's the number one place that I'll go to when I go to Washington. I will every single time go to the National Gallery of Art. Okay. And that whole strip there. Yeah. So there's a one, you know, the uh, the space space and uh, flight space and flight museum is amazing. The um, Museum of African Art, African American Art is amazing, and so oh. so on and so forth. But the Smithsonian American Art Museum, possibly a little bit overlooked by by foreign tourists, yeah. foreign visitors, maybe even by Americans themselves, is just brilliant and that's where this painting is um i mean you'll you'll find hoppers all over the place but if if and when we can travel again mm -hmm. and if and when you ever go to washington definitely go to that place it's um american art is is really wonderful it's actually funny though because we spend our time looking at what well, i'm looking at these online but it's going to be so exciting mm. to actually properly get in front of a painting mm. And 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 uh, using my new techniques. <laughs> Where am I? Like? Where's my eye first going? I'm so excited. So I'm, it look, it feels like even more than ever now that the government should be actually trying to encourage us all to to and the artists. Yeah, we need the artists now to make us oh, appreciate what we've got around us. What I do think is exciting, we, we, and obviously Brighton's a good example of this, Brighton and Hove, is how much really good local art goes yeah, on. It's so good. I mean, you know, I as a filmmaker with exhibition on screen, we have to focus on the big names. Yeah. And um, so the Hoppers and the Rembrandts and the Van Goghs and the Leonardos. But when you go to, um, like here, it's called Open House, mm. as you know. Yeah. Um, some of the local artists are absolutely fantastic, brilliant. I mm. mean, we've got a friend. I love her paintings. We just I just had one framed the other day to put up on the wall. Oh, brilliant! So I mean, there's an you know your house has got some beautiful paintings. Mm. Um, so again, that's the vagaries of. Well, it's interesting. She, do, I don't think she, my friend would have any interest in being. Well, she says she has no interest in being known as a. You know commercially successful artist she just loves painting and if she sells a few online and so be it um yeah well that's how, isn't that how no probably not i was thinking most artists when they start although didn't um edward hopper have to be an illustrator his parents mm. were like you have to make a living mm. so he had to do illustrations i quite liked his illustrations actually mm. but i think he hated doing them didn't he we didn't hate it, but it wasn't what he wanted to do. But yeah, I think some artists will need to deal with the market just to survive as yeah. artists. And then I think there are some artists that actually get so enthralled; mm. it becomes a bit of a league table. You know, mm. I, I could name some contemporary artists where I think that the amount that they sell their paintings for has perhaps become more important than actually the content of the painting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you got, you know, it's, it's, that's perhaps that's human nature, but that you want to see that your painting has gone at somebody's 10 million rather than one of your rivals. <laughs> but actually, realistically, <laughs> you only need to sell one painting at 10 million yeah. to have complete freedom to do whatever you like for the next 10 years, really. We get the paint self. <laughs> I know. We talk about this every time. Yeah. Actually, well, because I it's actually such... think I do fancy, since doing Hopper, I do fancy doing a painting. Wow. So there we are. Things have moved on. <laughs> you get me off the sewing machine. I just, I just really, really, really love his light. 
Well, just ending on that idea. So brilliant. They're so lovely. Just ending on that idea then. Mm. So where would you start? You've got a blank canvas. I don't know. I have done paintings, obviously, before. I've done a few life drawing classes and some flowers and things. Probably what most people have done. But I don't know. They're making me think now that you don't have to put too much in a painting. Mm. I think we've talked about this before, how you always overthink, oh, I've got to set this up. Yeah, the flowers and the vases and the oranges yeah. and all that, and actually no, just maybe make a start. It's like that Vermeer we looked at, where there was actually nothing on the wall but a few <laughs> a few old nails. Yeah, that was quite interesting. And then when we did Howard Hodgkin, I mean, he took yeah eleven years sometimes. Yeah, well, that's I think that's slightly <laughs> different. I remember once doing a film with Michael Palin and asking him, "When do you know that something is finished?" When is a sketch finished? When is a film finished? When is a TV documentary finished? When is your, one of your books finished? And he said, you know, that's really hard. Mm. And he said, I would say that every single time we've gone past the point where yeah. we should have said stop. Yeah. And we've overworked things or yeah. I've overworked things. Um, and I think sometimes with artists where it takes them, quote, unquote, 11 years, it's because they just don't know when to say it's finished. Right. You see, with that, with films... We set, we've just done it for our next season. We say, okay, that's when that film is being released. Yes. And then we work the back from, okay, that means that film has to be delivered on that date. Mm. Then you work back from there. Mm. And it absolutely focuses the mind. And I've just had it with, with my film about Afghanistan where we were editing that for months and months. And I could have edited it for months and months. But there came a point, it was like, the post production starts today. Because the film has to be finished then, because it's going out on television and going well, going to the cinemas then, and it's going on television then. So you kind of need that. Need that deadline. I um, I look forward to finding out, and and perhaps some of those people listening to this podcast already know. You know ha- what Hopper's painting practice was, and how long it took him to do paintings. Um, I mean, this this painting, I can imagine he could do relatively quickly, or it could take him a long time. Actually, when you look, again, there is quite a lot of very clever detail in the cornfield. It's not just a few brush strokes. I mean, he's taken his time and he, he's, you can feel the way, if you look carefully, you can, you know, it's, it is undulating and you can feel a, mm. maybe a little bit of breeze blowing mm. through it. The mountains at first look actually pretty dull, slate blue. Yeah. Nothing. But actually, look a bit more carefully and he spent a lot of time painting them perhaps quite realistically and maybe there's a green and brown of some gorse bush or some foliage of some sort um and then also when you look at the clothes it's it it's not just a few streaks of color it's he's taken a lot of time yeah you can also see some corrections that he's made i think well you can definitely see where he's he's changed things and I think if you can see where he's changed things, that would suggest a slight haste. I actually think what you just said was really nice, though, about maybe people should, because we sit and talk about these paintings, I don't really know much. It would be nice to have some comments of what people know. And then mm. we could learn some more. Because people might know, you know, like you say, obviously you'll get all the knowledge off the internet. Mm. There could be all sorts going on there. Oh, well, look, so, we're very happy for people listening to yeah. us to send through their comments. <laughs> and, um, and of course, go to, I mean, by, you know, obviously. Definitely, we, it'd be lovely. And we also want people, I mean, we have got some comments. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Luckily, um, they've all been quite nice. 99% of them have been. <laughs> um, the, uh, and, of course, you know, I'm going to encourage people always to go to the 7th hyphen art.com website yeah because there's plenty of film clips and behind the scenes stuff as well as access to 200 art films and um and they we, are great we have yeah. done a short film about edward hopper before and as i said we're now doing a proper feature film for the cinemas which i'm really looking forward to Lovely. and i think we should decide that's our moment to finish yes this week's Painting of the Week. Out to sunbathe. Thank you for listening to the Painting of the Week podcast. For more information, please visit our website 
at seventh-art.com or contact us by emailing info at seventh-art.com. See you next time.